What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're talking about coronary artery disease. This is gonna be a part of our clinical science section. If you guys wanna follow along and really understand this topic with some great notes, some great illustrations, go down in the description box below. We got a link to our website where you guys can check that out. Also, on our website, we are gonna be working on developing a USMLE Step 2 and a pants prep kind of course. So if you guys are interested, be on the alert. That'll be coming out pretty soon. Also, you guys like the merch? We got some new merch going on here. Check this out. Please go down the description box below and check out the link there as well. Get yourself some swagoo there. All right, we're gonna start talking about CAD. So, CAD, diseases of the coronary artery is what it is. We're not gonna go through, we should have already covered this in our basic kind of foundational science concepts about the coronary vascular anatomy. What I really want us to do to really kind of get straight to the point here is here we have a section of the heart. So I took and I cut the heart and I can see here parts of the ventricle. So here's going to be my right ventricle and here's my left ventricle. This will be the posterior portion and then over here coming out of the whiteboard like it's gonna punch you in the face, this is the anterior portion. What happens is you have vessels that are gonna be supplying this big chunky muscle of the actual heart. What are those? Those are the coronary vessels. In the most basic concept, there's four that I really need you guys to remember. One here in the posterior portion, guess what, it's not that hard. It's called the posterior descending artery. We're gonna abbreviate that as the PDA. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this supplies the posterior portion of the heart. It'll supply a little bit of the right ventricle, a little bit of the left ventricle as well. The other one, which is gonna be on this right part here, is called the right coronary artery. This one supplies the right ventricle and parts of the inferior portion of the left ventricle. This right here is the big daddy. This is the mac daddy of all the coronary vessels. This is the one that you don't wanna get occluded. This is called the LAD, or the left anterior descending artery. This one supplies the septum, it supplies the anterior wall of the left ventricle, and it even gives off some of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So really, really important artery. And the last one here that we have, oh, we're gonna zoom in on in just a second here, this one is called the left circumflex artery, which we're gonna abbreviate LCX, and that supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So when we talk about coronary artery disease, it's a disease of these vessels. So we have to zoom in on a chunk of this vessel in the associated myocardium. That's what we're gonna do here. So we're zooming in on this puppy. So this is a zoom in view of that, that portion there. So here we're gonna have a portion of the left circumflex artery, and here's a piece of myocardium. What happens in patients who have coronary artery disease is the most common cause of that disease is atherosclerosis. That is by far the most common cause. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is atherosclerosis and what causes atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis is these fatty plaques that develop within the wall of the actual blood vessel and occlude the actual blood flow. What leads to this? I want you to remember the mnemonic SAD-CHF. So SAD-CHF will give you the following things to remember. One is smoking. Second is advanced age. Now when I specifically talk about this one, I'm talking about greater than 45 for males and greater than 55 for females. Don't forget that. D, got the diabetes. The C is for cholesterol. So this one's kind of a funky one, right? So cholesterol is high. Now when I talk about cholesterol being high, which ones am I specifically talking about that's the real problem here? There's two of them. It's high LDL, and then a weird one that kind of doesn't completely go along with this is low HDL, so don't forget that as well. So a dyslipidemia. The next one is hypertension. And finally, a family history of coronary artery disease. So these particular risk factors will then do what? It'll stimulate this vessel to become diseased. It'll cause plaques to form within the actual coronary vessel. Now, when that happens, look what we get. We can get two particular scenarios here. You see this vessel here? Now look, you got this big old atherosclerotic plaque. The big difference here is that this is called stable current coronary artery disease because what happens is the plaque is kind of covered by this fibrous tissue. And the interesting thing about this plaque is that it's very stable, but what you will notice is that look at the lumen. In comparison here, the lumen is significantly smaller. So because of this, what's gonna to happen to the actual blood flow in this particular area here? There's going to be a reduction in the oxygen supply. If I have a reduction in oxygen supply because of having this big old stenosis, a luminal stenosis of the coronary vessel, that's gonna to lead to less oxygen being delivered to the myocardium. 
Now that may lead to ischemia, but generally these patients don't have a lot of ischemic symptoms. The chest pain is the primary classic finding. What really leads to this is something else. This myocardium decides to say, all right, you're giving me very little oxygen, but what if for some reason I decide to consume more oxygen? Huh, that's interesting. So what would be a reason why the patient would decide to have an increase in the oxygen consumption? Maybe they're demanding more, let's use that term. So there's an increase in the O2 demand. Now the reason for the reduced O2 supply is this plaque. This plaque is causing the reduced oxygen supply. What would be causing the increase in oxygen demand? There's two particular reasons that I want you to think about. One is the patient's heart rate decides to go through the stinking roof. They decide to tack away, maybe in the 170s, 180s, whatever it may be, that's causing the heart rate to go up. If the heart rate goes up, the heart has to beat faster, it has to work harder and consume more oxygen. If the demand goes up and the supply is low, you create a mismatch and a recipe for ischemia. So that's one particular reason. So if we have these two particular things here, this is a recipe for what? Ischemia. And what is ischemia? Ischemia can be simply defined as a reduction in perfusion to the tissue and it's inadequate to meet the tissue's demands. So that's the big stimulus here. Now, what's another reason why the O2 demand can go up? Another one is high blood pressure. If the patient has hypertension, they decide to shoot their blood pressure up. So now their afterload's crazy high. If their afterload is crazy, crazy high, now the heart is gonna have to beat so much harder to generate enough stroke volume to push blood out of the heart. That's the big concept here. And so this is why this is so interesting and because in patients who have stable coronary artery disease, when they're at rest, they don't really have any angina. What really starts to happen is when they start to exert themselves and increase their oxygen demand. Then they develop angina. And so one of the classic findings of CAD is that in these patients they have ischemia, but generally this ischemia, what's the way that they'll present? They'll present with angina. So let's actually do this in red here because this is the classic finding of patients who have stable CAD. But this angina is very, very specific. In the sense that the angina will only actually do what? increase or occur whenever the patient is exerting an increase in their demand. And so this is angina that is worse with exertion. Because if you exert yourself, you decide to go running, you decide to walk or you, whatever it may be, you increase your heart rate, you increase your blood pressure, you increase the demand. Then if you decide to decrease the demand, you stop exerting yourself, what would happen? The demand would go down, and the ischemia should actually go away. So this would get better with rest. This is generally the classic finding of patients who have stable CAD. They have a stable plaque reducing supply. If you increase their demand, this will cause worsening ischemia. All right, next, next concept here. This is the scary one. This is the one that most people are frightened of in CAD. They have a diseased coronary artery, right? We're just using this left circumflex as an example. They have a plaque. Maybe the plaque is somewhat stable, but it's not completely stable at certain parts. And what happens is this plaque decides to rupture. So you get what's called a plaque rupture, a plaque rupture. And why is that bad? Well, if you rupture that plaque, you expose that inner cheesy material, which is highly thrombogenic. When it's extremely thrombogenic, what happens here? When you have this massive plaque rupture, platelets love to come and stick to this. And then you develop this thrombus. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. So you have a plaque rupture, and this creates a thrombus that forms on the actual plaque. When you have a thrombus that forms on top of the plaque, now what happens to your O2 supply here? It's massively decreased. And so what happens in these particular patient populations is their O2 supply is incredibly low. And if you have an incredibly low O2 supply, you're gonna stop perfusing the myocardium. And the myocardium here is gonna start becoming ischemic. And that's the scary part of acute coronary syndrome. But we have to be able to differentiate these because they're a teensy bit different in nomenclature and understanding the actual disease process.
So let's say here I take three particular types of acute coronary syndromes. In one scenario, I rupture the plaque. When I rupture the plaque, it does kind of really kind of bust open. A lot of this thrombus starts to form. And then same thing here for NSTEMI. I rupture the plaque, a lot of thrombus begins to form. So we call this what? For these two, this is a subtotal occlusion. Now when I have a subtotal occlusion, because I form this, this thrombus on the plaque, then I'm reducing the blood supply very, very significantly, right? So definitely for both of these, I'm gonna have a reduction in O2 supply, very, very low O2 supply. But the big primary difference here is what happens to the myocardium. Now you're not giving enough oxygen to the tissue. In this particular scenario, if I have the patient having ischemia of their subendocardial layer, so I have what's called subendocardial ischemia, that is more specific for unstable angina. So this is going to be, again, a subendocardial ischemia. And here is the big, big difference. I reduce the supply. My subendocardial layer begins to start screaming. But here's the other thing. I don't kill any tissue. None of the tissue dies. And so there's a particular molecule that leaks from these tissues whenever there's tissue death. Do you guys know what that's called? Troponins. I know you guys are all screaming at home, right? So troponins. So what would I say, troponins, <laughs> what would I say about the troponins? Would they be positive or negative? They should be negative, right? So that should be one particular thing. They shouldn't really have a troponin bump. And on top of that, what we'll learn a little bit later is, is they shouldn't have any ST segment like elevation. They may have, because of this ischemia, they may have what's called some ST segment depressions or some T wave inversions. And that's the other thing that we'll actually remember for these two, but we'll go over that when we get into the diagnostic section. Now you're probably like, okay, these are kind of the same though, Zach. You said a subtotal occlusion for both of these. So what's the difference between unstable angina and NSTEMI? Well, really with an NSTEMI, I actually have my supply so low that I actually begin to infarct. So it's no longer subendocardial ischemia, this is called a subendocardial infarct. And that is the big difference here. I actually am causing death of the tissue. If there is death of the tissue, what will leak out as a result? Troponins. And so if the troponins are leaking out, they should be positive if we were to test them. So we will have a positive troponin leak. And the last thing is, is this is a small infarct. It doesn't cause ST elevation, but it does cause ST depression or T wave inversion. And that is how we really kind of differentiate between these two when it comes down to the pathophysiology. The last one here is gonna be for the STEMI. And for the STEMI, this one is primarily a total occlusion a complete total occlusion of that entire coronary vessel. So this vessel is completely jacked up. It is filled to the brim with clot. If I completely clot off this entire lumen, do I have any blood supply? No. And so the difference between these is that these have very little supply. This one's completely choked off. There is zero O2 supply. And if I get no oxygen supply to the myocardium, what begins to happen? It gets ticked off. And the entire myocardium begins to become damaged. And because that entire tissue is damaged, we call this transmural. This is a transmural infarct. The entire wall gets jacked up. That's no bueno. What would happen to the troponins? Through the roof. These usually will bump pretty high. And then the last thing is, this will definitely present with ST segment elevation. That's where we get the name. So we'll see particularly ST segment elevation. And we'll get into the details of that a little bit later, but they should have a positive troponin because of the transmural infarct, ST elevation because of the transmural infarct, and that is how we pathophysiologically describe STEMI.
The last thing, thing, the last thing that I want you guys to understand here is for stable CAD, they present with angina. Worse with exertion, better with rest because it's particularly exertional dependent. For acute coronary syndromes, their type of angina is a little bit different. For these guys, for the acute coronary syndromes, acute coronary syndrome findings, these guys present particularly with angina, same thing, same thing, but this can occur at rest and it is more intense. So there's an increased intensity of that pain. It is much, much more intense. And there is an increase in frequency of the pain. So when you're trying to compare the two between an acute coronary syndrome angina and a stable angina, this is really the big difference. If it occurs at rest, it's intense and it's occurring more and more frequently, that's more concerning for an acute coronary syndrome. If it's an angina that occurs with exertion and improves with rest or what we call nitro, which we'll talk about in the treatment section, that's stable angina. The other thing that I wanna talk about really quickly is this classic finding of angina, if you will. So when patients present with angina, it is a substernal type of chest pain. It's a squeezing, choking type of pain. And generally, this can, you wanna watch out for, radiate to the left neck, left face, left arm, all right? Other associated symptoms that can be atypical findings or anginal equivalents is epigastric abdominal pain and some nausea and diaphoresis, so watch out for that. All right, let's now take this understanding that we have of the pathophysiology and move into what happens if a patient does infarct, they damage their myocardium. What are some issues or complications that can arise? All right, my friends, so now the patient has come in, they have developed an NSTEMI or a STEMI. So they have infarcted some of their tissue. When a patient has infarcted some of their tissue, you're gonna start seeing potential issues and complications arise. What are those issues? What are those complications that we have to be weary of because it can have a high mortality rate? So one of the big things is when you start to infarct the tissue, it can increase the risk of arrhythmias. Arrhythmias usually develop within the first 24 hours after a patient has had some type of NSTEMI or STEMI. So this is the one that you wanna watch out for very early in that course. What can happen is, one of the things that I, you can actually see here is, you know whenever patients develop what's called a RCA occlusion, right? So they had developed what's called a right coronary artery occlusion. Do you guys remember which parts of the heart that supplied? Pretty straightforward, right? The right ventricle, an inferior aspect of the left ventricle. But another thing is it gives like this little branch that supplies the AV node. And sometimes in patients who get these RCA occlusions, you can actually destroy this structure here. So here's you have your AV node and you go into your bundle branches. I can actually destroy this structure here. And if I have an RCA occlusion, that leads to an AV node destruction, now what's gonna be the problem with that? This is supposed to be able to allow for electrical activity to go from the atria into the ventricles. Now you lose that. You're gonna start developing AV blocks. And so this patient could develop a AV block that could precipitate a profound bradycardia. And so this is something that you wanna watch out for. Watch out for like second degree heart blocks, third degree heart blocks. This is something that can be potentially evident. So if the patient's developed an RCA occlusion, this RCA occlusion could potentially cause AV node destruction, which could then lose the electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles, precipitating an AV block. And now the actual infra, uh, uh, nodal components or like the Purkinje system now have to take over the actual rate of the heart. And that will lead to a profound beta bradycardia. All right, so that's one thing to watch out for. So if you have a patient who has then had an NSTEMI or STEMI, check potentially if they have bradycardia, you really wanna watch out for that as a potential complication. The other thing that can happen, and you usually see this with any kind of like LAD or left circ kind of occlusions. This is usually going to affect the left side of the heart. So whenever these patients actually develop an infarct, they start to damage this left ventricular tissue. And whenever you damage this left ventricular tissue, you infarct it, now you create a re-entrant circuit. So LED, left circumflex occlusions, can increase what's called re-entrant circuits. The problem with that is, is that if you create re-entrant circuits within the ventricle, this can create a ventricular rhythm. And that is absolutely terrifying. Because you know what these patients can potentially develop? 
If they develop this reentrant circuit that then starts flying off these kind of electrical activities, the patient can potentially go into what's called ventricular tachycardia. That could potentially go to ventricular fibrillation. And then from there, sudden cardiac death. So you really want to watch out for these potential complications in patients who develop an end STEMI or STEMI. And again, just to remind you, when is this the most profound? Usually, you want to watch out in the first 24 hours after an end STEMI or a STEMI for particular types of arrhythmias. All right, so these are the two big ones that I want you to remember here. The next really, really scary one that you can't miss, and again, this is usually most common in the first 24 hours as well, is acute heart failure. This is one of the big causes of acute heart failure. So with arrhythmias, particularly VTAC, VFib, or profound AV blocks like bradycardia, you want to think about myocardial ischemia. From acute heart failure, you want to think about myocardial ischemia as well. Think about it, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say here we have the left ventricle, and then I decide to develop a, let's say a massive LAD occlusion. You can get this from your, your left circ, but I'd say the left, uh, the LAD would probably be the most disastrous one to have because it supplies the septum, the apex, and even a part of the lateral wall. You imagine knocking this thing out? Oh my gosh, that'd be terrifying. So if you infarct this entire tissue, what are you gonna do? You're gonna drop the contractility now. Now you've caused damage to multiple myocardial tissues. You drop the left ventricular contractility. You're gonna drop the left ventricular ejection fraction. If you drop the left ventricular ejection fraction, now you're not getting blood out of the heart. So the problem with this is, is that if I damage this tissue, I'm not gonna be able to get blood out of the left ventricle and out into the aorta. This process is going to be inhibited. So there's going to be a drop in, what's that called? The volume of blood that gets pumped out of the heart within one minute, my cardiac output. So my cardiac output will drop. Then I won't perfuse tissues. If the cardiac output drops enough, what's that formula? Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. If my cardiac output goes down enough, it can potentially drop my blood pressure. So the patient may develop hypotension. But the most worrisome complication here is if that hypotension leads to reduced perfusion to the tissue, it can put a patient into what's called cardiogenic shock. So this is when they're not perfusing the tissues and you wanna watch out for like potentially multi-system organ failure. Other organs are gonna start failing such as the kidneys, right? And that's a really, really big thing to watch out for. So again, because you lose, you have this LED occlusion, you knock out a big portion of the left ventricular uh, contractility, you reduce the left ventricular ejection fraction. And what happens is that drops the cardiac output, that can lead to hypotension, and can stimulate a patient going into cardiogenic shock. So you really wanna watch out for this, a reduction in contractility, a reduction in left ventricular ejection fraction, then precipitating this low cardiac output and cardiogenic shock. Here's the other scary thing. If the blood can't go forward, so you have a problem getting blood going forward, where will it go then? What happens is the blood will start backing up into the left atrium. And when it backs up into the left atrium, it'll go back into your pulmonary circulation. When it goes back into the pulmonary circulation, where do you think it's gonna go? It's gonna go right into the lungs, my friend. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start filling the lungs with fluid because the hydrostatic pressure and the pulmonary veins are gonna start increasing and fluid's gonna leak out. And these patients will develop a profound pulmonary edema. So you want to watch out for these patients developing pulmonary edema. And this can lead to hypoxia. So if you have a patient who has just had an end STEMI or a STEMI, they now are developing features of pulmonary edema such as dyspnea, or watch out for that as well. They can also develop not just profound hypoxia, but they may, may develop dyspnea. So watch out for dyspnea as well. Or hypoxia. So if you have a patient who has an end STEMI or a STEMI, massive LED occlusion, they knock out the actual contractility, they lose their left ventricular ejection fraction, they don't pump blood out so they develop hypotension and perform perfusion to the tissues, and pulmonary edema, this is something that you want to think about as acute heart failure in a patient who's had an MI. All right, that's this one. Very, very scary one. You really want to get on top of that one. The next one is pericarditis. This one is actually one of the nice ones, like if you wanted to get any complication, this is probably the ones you want to get, because 
This is the one where it's not gonna have a super high mortality rate. It's not fun, I don't wanna deny that, but it's not gonna be the scary one. So if you develop an infarct generally anywhere near the pericardium, you're gonna have infarction of tissue, right? Neutrophils, macrophages will all come into this area and try to clean it up and lay down some granulation tissue, but there's gonna be a lot of inflammation in this area. It's not out of this world to think that the inflammation will extend to the nearby pericardium. And if it extends to the nearby pericardium, this can cause inflammation of the pericardium, which will lead to pericarditis. Now, when patients present with pericarditis, they present with what's called a pleuritic. That's one of the big differences here. So sometimes what gets scary and hard to suss out with these patients is, is they had an MI. They came in because they presented with chest pain. Now they're presenting with chest pain again. You have to be able to differentiate the two. Is it squeezing? Is it choking? Is it feel like there's someone sitting on your chest kind of pain? Radiates to the left jaw, neck, arm? Or is it this type of pain where it's a, a kind of more of a pain that hurts whenever you're taking breaths? Does it actually change whenever you kind of lean forward a little bit and offload the pressure on the pericardium? So there's a positional component of it. That's more suggestive of pericarditis. Another thing is that you want to listen because if the pericardium gets really, really inflamed, the layers start kind of actually rubbing up against one another and it creates a weird rub on auscultation. We call it a friction rub. We call it a friction rub. And so generally, in patients who have low grade fevers, a pleuritic chest pain, a positional type of chest pain. Another one, great for your boards, is a chest pain that radiates to the trapezius. That's classic in your vignette, so don't forget that one as well. But if it presents like this, after having some type of cardiac event, you definitely want to think about pericarditis. Now sometimes, and I, and I hate it, we start thinking, could there be another component to this? Like, there's two different types of pericarditis. There's called fibrinous pericarditis, right? So there's two types. One is called Fibrinus, and the other one is called Dressler's. How do I suss out the two? In Fibrinus pericarditis, it's usually very soon, generally one to three days after having the cardiac event. So that's one thing. So if you have a patient who's approximately one to three days post-MI, it's more likely Fibrinus for your exams. In true life, this isn't truly that important. But if it's for your exams, Dressler's is usually a little bit later. So it's a kind of pleuritic chest pain with a friction rub that comes generally about 14 days, two weeks after an MI. So approximately two weeks post MI. And that's one of the things that they may try to trip you up on your exam. In true life, it's not that important, but for your exams, something to not forget about. All right, so we got arrhythmias. We got acute heart failure. We got the pericarditis. We come down to the ones that usually cause sudden hemodynamic collapse. And these are terrifying as well. These, I'd say, are less common in the new reperfusion era, which we have PCI as the primary way that we reperfuse people. But complications that can arise. And a patient who gets an LED occlusion, all right, so an LED occlusion, what happens is, is one of the parts that can get really jacked up here is the interventricular septum. So whenever there is a infarct of the interventricular septum, you damage this tissue. So now look, this interventricular septum's all jacked up. It's all infarcted. What can happen is sometimes when the tissue is super weak and necrotic, it can actually be thin enough that you can rupture the septum. And you can create what's called a ventricular septal defect. And look at this. Now, when I rupture this puppy, I have a big hole <laughs> in between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And generally, blood's gonna go from the high pressure system into the low pressure system. So it'll go from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. What that will do is that'll cause the patient to present with a murmur. So usually they'll present with a murmur, some type of holosystolic murmur. So if you hear a new murmur on the patient, definitely one of these things that you wanna think about, and it'll precipitate heart failure. Generally, it'll cause the patient to go into a right heart failure before they go into left heart failure. So it's more common that they'll get right greater than left because think about it, you're overloading the right ventricle. Blood is squirting from the left ventricle into the right ventricle and you're overloading the right ventricle. So that's something to think about. But in a patient who presents with hemodynamic collapse and a holosystolic murmur, think about a VSD. The other one that's also really interesting as well that you really wanna think about here is going to be a patient who presents with what's called a papillary muscle rupture. 
So let's say that they have an occlusion here. And this occlusion, what it does is it knocks out the blood flow, particularly this you can, you can see with a bunch of different types. You can see this usually with inferior ischemia. So usually right ventricular or RCA occlusion. So if a patient develops like an RCA occlusion, what can happen is this can cause a papillary muscle ischemia. So this will cause papillary muscle ischemia or infarct. Let's actually, let's say infarct. So again, you have an occlusion there, you're infarcting the tissue, that's end stemming and stemming. You develop an infarct of the papillary muscle. When you infarct that tissue, now it's supposed to be holding on to the chordae tendineae. It can't hold on to the chordae tendineae anymore. And so if you can't hold on to this chordae tendineae, what is it gonna do? This sucker's gonna break right off. It was supposed to be anchoring it down. Now look at it, it's flapping in the wind. Because of that, you can't hold this valve down. And what happens is, this valve becomes super unstable, and it can easily, whenever the patient goes into like systole, whenever they have what's called ventricular systole, this valve can blow right open. And now you get something called regurgitation. Now a regurgitant jet, instead of going this way, can fly back into the left atrium. And so you really want to watch out for that. So when a patient develops an RCA occlusion, they infarct their papillary muscle, what happens is they can develop what's called acute mitral regurgitation. And that will cause a murmur, believe it or not, similar to a VSD, a holosystolic murmur, and it'll put the patient into heart failure. Usually, in this particular scenario, left more than right, obviously, because it's gonna be affecting the left side now. So these are the things that you really want to watch out for. Pretty scary one. Again, not as common in the reperfusion era. This last one is probably the most terrifying. This one I feel like most people usually just die because they, they go into PEA arrest because their left ventricle just explodes. But what happens is you get a really big LAD occlusion, usually in combination with the left circumflex. But what happens is you infarct this entire left ventricular free wall. Imagine this whole thing is dead. Super weak, as it becomes weak, boom. This entire free wall ruptures. Oh my gosh, this is so terrifying. Blood that's in your left ventricle will then squirt out right into your pericardium. As the blood starts filling into the pericardium, what is this called? Hemopericardium. Imagine all that pressure from your left ventricle just squirting blood into that pericardium. That is terrifying. So what happens is you get an LED occlusion, you get a free wall infarct. This thing causes a free wall rupture, and this will push a patient into what's called, what is this? When you have a lot of blood that's accumulating within the pericardium, and it's squeezing on the heart, not allowing for it to properly fill. It's called cardiac tamponade. So this is another one that you wanna watch out for. We'll talk about this in the uh, pericardial disease section, but you wanna watch out for a patient developing that Beck's triad, right? So the jugular venous distension, the hypotension, and the muffled heart sounds. That would be another really, really big one. And then again, you can potentially see signs of like pulses paradoxes. But again, we'll go over all that in the pericardial disease section. All right, this is another potential complication. The last one that I want you guys to watch out for here is again, another type of LAD occlusion. So if you get an LED occlusion, and then what happens is it infarcts this particular tissue here, right? So you could develop some death of this tissue. Then what happens is something kind of weird. It ruptures, but it doesn't rupture the way that you would normally think. So it doesn't completely rupture the free wall. And what happens is you develop a, ru a rupture here, but it's kind of contained. There's like a fibrin kind of like cloth that's kind of stabilizing the rupture. So it doesn't allow blood to empty into the actual pericardial cavity. So it's a contained rupture. We don't call this an aneurysm per se, even though it kind of looks like it, it's a pseudo aneurysm or a contained rupture. So we call this, it creates a pseudo aneurysm. The problem with this is that now blood can kind of just stay in this area. This can create like a stasis of blood flow. What happens when you create stasis of blood flow? 
clots, Virgo striad, right? And so then this can lead to clots forming here. And if you get a clot that forms right in here, and then it decides to flick a part of that clot off, what do you get? Thromboembolic complications. That patient gets like a stroke or something, right? So you want to watch out for thrombo emboli. These are the big, big things that I want you guys to associate in patients who have had an end STEMI or a STEMI. All right, now that we've covered all the pathophys, the issues and the complications with myocardial ischemia and coronary artery disease, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to diagnose these diseases. A patient comes in, they have anginal chest pain. And the classic way that I taught you guys, what do we do? First thing, EKG. You can add on some cardiac biomarkers like troponin and CKMB, but they're not always gonna be the first test of choice. ECG should be the first test. Once you've done that, if you see this, it's normal. There's nothing really bad about this. You can get a troponin. If it's negative, that again supports the concept that maybe this is a stress-induced ischemia and we didn't stress them enough. So maybe this is stable angina. We'll talk about the, the workup of that in a little bit. If you have a patient who doesn't have stress-induced angina, then you're thinking that they have an acute coronary syndrome, that this doesn't require a change in demand. So that's going to be things like T-wave inversions, ST-segment depressions, and then you're thinking about things like an end STEMI or an unstable angina. How do I determine that? I want to know which one developed an infarct. That's the importance of the pathophysiology. If it's ischemia, they'll have a negative troponin. That's unstable angina. If the troponin is positive, that means that they had an infarct. That's an end STEMI. If I see this, ah, so that's a STEMI right there, right? That's a big old tombstoning. You know, things are puckering up down there. That's not good. This is ST elevation. This should make you think about a STEMI. If you check the troponin and it's positive, it would be way more suggestive of an ST segment elevation of my. There is this potential though, that if you see ST elevation in a patient who has cocaine, triptan, smoking, younger, respond to calcium channel blockers and their troponin is negative, it's a little bit more suggestive of vasospastic angina. All right, that's how I would start this process. Chest pain, EKG, cardiac biomarkers, determine if the patient has the worst case scenario, which is a STEMI. If they have a STEMI, what do I do? I wanna know where the heck that STEMI is. So then I'm gonna to try to localize the STEMI. And this is where EKGs are gonna be a little bit more helpful in your exam. So what they'll do is they'll say, hey, here's an EKG. What do you think is the vessel that's occluded? So the first one here is gonna be an anterior. And I told you that's V1 to V4. Look for any ST elevation in these leads. And if you see that, that would be suggested that the LED maybe be occluded. If you're looking at the next one, which is an inferior one, you're looking at two, three in AVF, and I see ST elevations. Maybe the right coronary artery is occluded. With that being said, if you think a right, if you have an inferior MI, you should always do right-sided chest leads. Just as a quick aside, because it may show that the right ventricle is actually becoming infarcted, and that's important to be able to identify. But nonetheless, lateral, the left circumflex, it's one, and then AVL, and then V5 and V6. You're looking for ST elevations there. And that would suggest the left circumflex is occluded. And then lastly, if I see ST depressions or T wave inversions in V1 to V3, I slap on the posterior chest leads in V7 to V9, and I see ST elevations, that's suggestive of a PDA occlusion. This is the way that they could try to test you on the exam as to where the actual STEMI you think is occurring, which vessel is diseased or occluded. Now, with that being said, ECGs are really, really good. Combining it with an echocardiogram is even better. Because what you're doing is you're kind of making a correlation between the chest leads where you think the vessel is actually occluded and then correlating that with wall motion abnormalities where the areas of the ventricles aren't contracting very well with the vascular territory. So you can kind of see here, I'm not going to go crazy because you won't be heavily tested on this, but if you see V1 to V4 ST elevations and you look on the echo and you see that the, this territory, the LED isn't contracting well, then you can say, oh man. I really think that this person is having a STEMI, and this kind of correlates. And you can even correlate this with end STEMIs as well. But that's an important thing to do is to correlate, hey, anterior wall motion abnormality, hey, maybe the LED's knocked out. RV is not contracting very well, they have an inferior wall motion abnormality, maybe the RCA is knocked out. Left circumflex knocked out, oh, maybe that lateral wall isn't really contracting very well. Or maybe the posterior wall isn't contracting very well. Correlate your echo with your ECG. All right, lastly, in most patients on your clinical vignette, you're gonna get the ECG, you're gonna see that they have ST segment elevation, maybe you get a troponin, it's positive, they're having crushing chest pain, what's the test of choice, but it's also the therapeutic like option in these patients. It's usually going to get a coronary angiogram. 
The benefit of this is that you're going to be, for most patients, when they're getting the angiogram, you're showing the occlusion, but you're also going to treat the occlusion. You're going to go in and put a stent in that area. You're going to balloon it open and put in a stent. But this is a really good test and probably the best test to find where the occlusion is. So again, you'll snake a catheter up there, shoot contrast, and look to see which of the vessels are not filling and where is the occlusion. And again, that's one of the best possible tests you could do. All right. So if a patient has a STEMI, go through that progression. What's the ECG show? Where would it potentially localize, correlate it with your echo, and send them to the actual cath lab to find the occlusion and then treat the occlusion. If they present with a normal ECG and a normal troponin, then we're thinking about that stable angina patient. But we still are scared because they have anginal chest pain. We would wanna send them for a stress test. So we've ruled out ACS, and we're gonna say, can the patient exercise? If they can, then you wanna go ahead and do what's called stress exercise testing. And so what we'll do is we'll kinda of say, okay, there's a couple different options we could do here. We can get a baseline ECG, or we can do what's called a myocardial perfusion imaging where we give them the, like a radioactive tracer that shows areas of perfusion in their heart, or we can do an echocardiogram and see if it's squeezing normally. Once we do that, we're gonna make them work out, get them on a treadmill and have them reach the kind of a target heart rate. Once we've done that and they start to experience maybe any symptoms or they get tachyarrhythmias or we actually repeat the ECG, MPI or echocardiogram, what are we looking for? After we've really stressed the heart, if I see on the ECG, oh, there are signs of ischemia, that's stress-induced ischemia. That would be helpful in telling me that this is a positive stress test. If I didn't do the ECG test and I did the MPI, then I'd be looking for areas of poor perfusion. If I have to make them work out and I ex increase their demand, now these areas are gonna be becoming suffering. They're gonna suffer now. And the last thing, if I do an echocardiogram and I see areas that aren't contracting very well, maybe they have an LAD really big plaque there, and I see that their anterior wall isn't contracting very well after I had them exercise, I could say, oh, there we go. We have stress-induced wall motion abnormalities. So these are all ways that if this happens and we see these changes, that's a positive test. Now, the reasons why you would do an MPI or an echocardiogram, because usually this is the first line, is if their ECG has some weird things on them. Usually if they have like a left bundle, it makes it really hard, or if they have Q waves, it makes it a little bit difficult. So you may do an echo or an MPI in those scenarios, okay? But we go to the other end of this algorithm, which is the patient cannot exercise. Maybe they have terrible osteoarthritis. They have some type of like rheumatological condition where they can't ambulate. They just, they can't do these things. They can't exercise at all. In those scenarios, then you have to kind of precipitate the same increase in demand by giving them drugs. Two of the things that we would do is we would, again, get a baseline MPI or an echocardiogram. And then we would give them a medication that would either really reduce the supply or increase their demand. One is adenosine or dipyridamol. And what it does is it decreases the supply. It's actually really cool. I'll show you how it does it in a second. But I'm gonna get the baseline, see what it looks like, and then give them this drug. And what it should do is if they have stress-induced ischemia, it should produce cold spots on their MPI. I could also do the same concept, give them a, an echo, Look for any like contractions of their ventricles. Give them dobutamine. That should make their heart have to pump faster and pump harder, which will increase the demand and it should show wall motion abnormalities. And that would be a potential stress-induced ischemia. Now let's explain this adenosine or dipyridamol. It's actually really cool. It's called coronary still syndrome. Here we give dipyridamol or adenosine. What it does is it does not vasodilate the disease vessel and it dilates the normal healthy vessels. If you dilate a vessel, you reduce the systemic vascular resistance and you drop the pressure in this area and it's easier for blood to flow in this direction. But then what happens is you don't dilate this vessel. The pressure doesn't drop in this area and now blood won't wanna go this way. It'll wanna go to the lower pressure circuit. And so this is literally gonna steal blood away from the diseased area. The supply is already reduced. You're gonna reduce it even more. And that's gonna precipitate ischemia and cause poor areas of perfusion. So that's the concept of this. Pretty interesting. Either way, you do any of these tests and it becomes positive. Usually the next thing is to say, okay, let's try to treat the patient. We know that they have some type of stress induced ischemia. Let's try to get them a little bit better. But if we have any inkling that this patient may need to kind of go and get revascularized, do something like a coronary angiogram, look for the actual occlusion, determine the severity of it, or coronary CTA, it's non-invasive. And this will help you to determine to look at the actual vascular lesion. So here's a coronary CTA, and then here is a coronary angiogram to look for any kind of lesions that are present. So you can see here's like this little stenotic area. And you can see kind of stenotic areas here as well. But that's the concept. Now, after we've done this, we've now determined 
the approach for stable CAD and the approach for STEMI. The approach for patients who have NSTEMI and unstable angina, you really kind of just determine them already. You determine if it's unstable angina or NSTEMI based upon the troponin, and you're gonna treat those guys relatively the same. Now that we've done this, how do we go about treating the first patient, which is the stable patient? Well, the first thing is you don't want that plaque to rupture, but more importantly, if that plaque does rupture, I don't want a thrombus to form on the plaque because it'll become subtotally or totally occluded, and then I end up with an ACS scenario. So how do I do that? Aspirin. Simple. Next thing is I really want to reduce their anginal chest pain. So I want to reduce the oxygen demand. So the ways that I can do that is nitroglycerin because that reduces preload and dilates the coronary vessels. And the second thing, which is even more beneficial than that, is beta blockers. There is other drugs, so there's not just nitroglycerin, this is short acting, but the drugs that you can give for long acting effect would be things like isosorbide dinitrate, and there is the benefit of calcium channel blockers as well. So it's usually beta blockers, then PRN, sub sublingual nitroglycerin, long acting, isosorbide dinitrate, which is another type of nitro, and the last line is usually calcium channel blockers. And then after that, there's another one called renolism, but we're not gonna go there. All right, you've treated the patient with aspirin. You put them on a beta blocker. They have sublingual nitro. You've treated them with isosorbide dinitrate. But now, the patient has a positive stress test that is really, really bad. They have an angiogram, which they got, and it showed really, really bad lesions, like an LAD that was like super stenotic or they have been symptomatic despite aspirin, despite statins, despite a beta blocker, isosorbate nitrate, sublingual nitro, et cetera, and they're still having chest pain. These patients have to be revascularized. So when you wanna revascularize these, there's two options. There's PCI or cabbage. How do I determine? If there's no left main lesion, no left main coronary artery lesion, they have less than three vessels that are placked up and they have a normal left ventricular EF, it is preferable to do a PCI, so a percutaneous coronary intervention. Now, what we do is, is we open up the artery, we take a balloon, we inflate the balloon, and you're gonna kinda try to open up and expand this area. Then what you're gonna do is, is you're gonna pull back the balloon and leave in this stent, which is gonna hopefully keep this vessel nice and open. That is the concept here. But once we place this stent in, we do not want this stent to clot off. And we'll talk about what we'll do for that in a second. What about the patient who gets the cabbage? It's the exact opposite. They got a left main coronary artery lesion. They got three or more vessels that are placked up and their EF stinks. Probably better for these patients to get a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. So they have a lesion like right here. I'll take a graft and I'll move this over this way. And sometimes we'll take like the internal mammary artery or we'll take the greater saphenous vein and we'll take those veins, cut pieces of them and use them as the grafts to bypass these lesions. You see how we're bypassing all of these lesions here? That's the concept. But to come back here, we put this stent in. When I put a stent in, I don't want it to thrombose. And so I'll put them on dual antiplatelets. So in other words, they'll be on aspirin plus something like clopidogrel or dicagrelor for at least one year. Then after that year, you can downgrade to just one of those antiplatelets, whether it's aspirin or it's clopidogrel. But I have to keep this on so that they don't stent, uh, thrombose this stent, because that's terrible. They can develop a reinfarction. So that's the concept here. Here is the actual kind of like stent here. And I want to prevent this. I do not want them to like completely thrombose that stent. All right. The last thing is you can add them on statins as well. Statins help to prevent the actual plaque from continuing to hopefully get bigger and bigger and bigger. We don't want that. So again, standard therapy, aspirin, beta blocker, nitro sublingual, PRN, isosorbid and nitrate for long-term control, beta blockers if need be. Add on the statin. They're still symptomatic. Angiogram shows high-risk lesions. The stress test is really bad. Revascularize them. PCI based upon this, cabbage based upon this. If they get the stent, they need do antiplatelet therapy for a year. All right, unstable angina and NSTEMI, it's similar. You first want to prevent the thrombus from propagating. So you give them aspirin plus clopidogrel plus heparin. That's the big difference. You see how they, we, we load them with this before we even revascularize them. So we load them with aspirin plus clopidogrel plus heparin. So it's called dual antiplatelet therapy plus heparin. Now, if I want to revascularize the patient who has unstable angina or an NSTEMI, I need to have particular indications. And there's usually three. One, as I do what's called a risk stratification tool called the TEMI score. There is other ones out there. This is the one that sometimes is tested on this step too. 
If the Timmy score is greater than three, that, in, that kind of predicts a higher mortality rate for these patients. And that means that they should probably go to the cath lab and get revascularized. The next one is if they develop cardiogenic shock. Remember I told you the two big complications of MIs is VTAC, VFib, because you can cause a ventricular arrhythmia, or cardiogenic shock from a really nasty infarction. If that happens where there's hemodynamic or electrical instability, they need to go to the cath lab because the cause of their instability is the occlusion. And the last one here is refractory angina. They're symptomatic despite aspirin, dual antiplatelet therapy, heparin. They're symptomatic despite beta blockers, nitro, morphine, statins, all of those things, they need to get revascularized. And the decision of which revascularization technique is the same. And then if you stent them, you need dual antiplatelet therapy for at least one year. Okay, we come to STEMI. If a patient has a STEMI, it is the exact same process. You load them up, you give them 325 of aspirin, you load them up with clopidogrel or ticagrelor, you load them up with heparin and put them on a heparin infusion, and they go to the cath lab as soon as they possibly can. And again, most of the time, you're gonna be placing a stent. In these rare scenarios, you may be considering a cabbage. But most of the time, you're gonna be going to the cath lab. What if the patient is at a hospital that does not have a PCI capable facility. Then you give them the TPA and you transport them as quickly as you possibly can to a PCI capable facility to put a stent in. No matter what, even if they get TPA, the guidelines say that they should still get PCI done. That is the concept here. All right, the last thing that I wanna add on here is after the patient has received revascularization, you want to prevent ventricular remodeling because this has been shown to be beneficial. If the patient is hypertensive or their blood pressure can tolerate it, you want to get them on ACE inhibitors or ARBs because it's been shown to reduce the ventricular remodeling. And that is the treatment for STEMI. And that, my friends, covers coronary artery disease. I hope you guys liked it, hope it made sense, and I hope it helped. As always, until next time. Mm -hmm.